We've got to realize that we're not here to be happy as a man. Your main job is to be like that God on the cross. If we're going around thinking about we, we deserve to be happy all the time, then guess what that means? Well, if I deserve to be happy, then that means God, my wife, and kids, they're just kind of down there. You get confidence through giving your life away. That's where you get your worth as a man. I tell the men in my program, from this day forward, your happiness means nothing because that's selfishness. That's thinking about me. When a man starts to get his mind off of his wants, desires, and needs, then what he does is he gets his energies into God, his wife and marriage, and his children. Then he becomes happy, confident, self-aware. Jerry, my brother, welcome to the Superman Life. Thanks, Rich Lynn. How you doing? I'm doing good, brother. Been yeah. uh, been really fired up and excited about uh, today's conversation. You know, because I love your work. I love the mission in terms of recon reconnecting men with their God-given mission, so they can protect, defend, and serve their families. And I'm sure you would agree with this, and and, and a lot of the audience as well. I think when we look across the world and society right now, uh, and really a lot of the problems that we're facing. I think a lot of them are, are rooted and stemming from what would maybe be defined as a marriage crisis. I mean, the divorce rate, over 50%. You look at the fatherlessness homes, not just the fathers not in the home, but then the fathers that are there, but not present. So, so I love your work because you're calling out the men. So I think to kind of kick off today's conversation, Jerry, I'd love your opinion and thoughts on what you think the biggest battle men are facing when it comes to succeeding in their marriage. Is it something that they're battling internally mindset, belief systems, overall values, lack thereof, maybe some values and principles, or is there an external force that they're fighting in terms of what's the biggest battle that they're facing and not succeeding in their marriage? Well, the, the, the main thing is, man, men are failing because we don't understand our mission. We don't even understand what we hear, why we create it, what's my purpose in this life. Um, it's all disconnected. And so basically what we do when we don't know what we're supposed to be doing, then we go for pleasure. Pleasure is our thing. Pleasure in our job. Pleasure in sex. Pleasure in pornography. Or ple just pleasure in going to the golf course. E playing video games. Everything is about pleasure. That's called effeminacy. When, men get a when people get attached to pleasure in order to do what's hard. So what's hard? Prayer. Understanding God. Understanding those, t asking yourself those tough questions like, what mission was I given to even be here? That's the main, main problem. Um, that And then, so what happens is when we don't involve uh, the supernatural world in our life, God in our life, Jesus Christ in our life, what happens is we get lost. We don't, we get depressed. Like the guy you were talking to, the doctor you were talking to this morning, he was saying all this stuff about people can't sleep, you know, they haven't stressed and all that stuff. That's because men don't really understand what we're supposed to be doing and we don't know how to combat the evil one in our life. Yeah, I love that, man. And, and, and I would agree that there is a there is a purpose crisis or lack there of mission with a lot of men. That's that's really centered at the work that we do with a lot of our guys. You know, you mentioned kind of that struggling with pleasure seeking behavior that sits right at the core of everything we're doing at Rebuild Recovery. Circling back to the question, though. So lack of mission, is that due to internal circumstances? Or is there something that is in the way of men getting to their mission? Well, the problem is men weren't taught how to be men. We're not even taught how to be men these days. When I start talking to men, they go, what? And then they start going, oh, my God, I wish somebody had taught me that. Um, so let's, let's just go over what the mission is. So to, to, then that way you'll have more questions. That might help answer your question better. So the way I explain it is this. In the Garden of Eden, when God um, created Adam, he had him to name stuff. Right. Everybody knows that story. OK, so right off the bat, God is telling Adam, you are responsible for everything. You're the leader. You're responsible because Eve wasn't even created yet. So first of all, you are responsible. That means that you're, God is saying, Adam, which is our first father, you are responsible for everything in your house. Your house is the diapers, the dishes, the happiness of your wife, the success of your marriage, um, the kids, the, the trash. You're responsible for the money. You're responsible for everything. But see, the deal is God knew, well, we can't do it all on our own because we needed some help. That's why he created that beautiful Eve, our wife. So what is her thing? Her mission is what? Her mission is the children. 
to, 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 to nurture the children and to nurture her husband. And we can get into feminism later, but I'm just telling you what in the, of the natural law of things, this is how God has set it up. So the reason is men, our job is more broad. Wise mothers, their job is, is, is the children is smaller, but both jobs are equally important. It's just that each doesn't have time. So now with that being said, that's the general mission of you as a man, okay? My thing is many guys have a lot of, have a lot of problem accepting that. But once I had a hard time accepting that, okay, I'm responsible for everything? Like everything? Yes. That doesn't mean you do everything. That just means you're responsible for everything, okay? So that gives you a threefold mission. Your first mission as a man is to protect. So protect is protect um, your home from physical outside threats, provide, that kind of thing. The other thing is to protect your wife from you. So protection has two kind of things. The reason why you have to protect your wife from you and the reason why wives leave men and lose their husbands is because men start to treat their wife like a partner, like a buddy at work, like a stranger on the street. But that's not, that's not it. Your wife is your beloved. And so if we, if we call her names, if we raise our voice at her, if we argue with her, if we criticize her, if we blame her, if we fight with her, if we neglect her, then our wife starts to get hurt and starts to think, what? He doesn't love me. And then what? Well, if he doesn't love me, what am I here for? Because you have to understand women, they don't have all these, they don't sign up for having all these kids, washing all these dishes, working 8 to 12 hours a day, uh, changing diapers and all that kind of stuff. They sign up for what? For the love of their beloved husband. And if that's not there, they, they start to feel unloved. And once they start to feel unloved, the, the emotional connection leaves, and then she's out of there. Now, the second mission as a man is to defend. Defend against what? The diabolical in your home. Most men don't know that one. And if they do know it, they don't know how to do it. Okay? It's very important that people, that men understand, while you're out there talking to floozies, playing golf, playing video games at work because you love your job and career, Satan walks right past you upstairs and gets in bed with your wife and kids. And you know how I know that's true? Because most people have chaos in their home. They're miserable. Their wife's miserable. Their kids are disrespectful. The kids don't listen to them. You know, that's Satan. People think evil is a serial killer or a rapist. That's true. But evil is also pain in your life, right? So that's that. The third mission of a man is to serve. Now, most people think, well, I'm the leader. I'm going to run around here telling everybody what to do. And if I say do something, I ain't got to do what I'm saying doing, but you, <laughs> you got to do what I say. That's not the mission of a Christian soldier. His job is to serve, which means what? You serve God first in this order. You serve God first, your wife in marriage second, and your kids are way down the line. Most people today take their kids and put their kids above God or their husband or their husband, the husband above the wife, you know, the kids above the wife. And it's, 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 total, it's a total you-know-what fest. And people don't really understand that there's a way to serve. And once you serve as a man, what will happen is your wife and children will say, oh, my God, how can I be worthy of him? Because right now, most men, they're not really worthy of the gift of that wife and kids that, they're, 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 uh, that God has given them. They're really not. So they have to be taught that because, like I said, a lot of this is not a man's fault because nobody teaches us this these days. So we're just out there. Yeah, brother, I appreciate that, man. And, and what I really enjoyed about what you shared there is the attention to the precision at which the language that you use, right? I, you, you gave this example of your wife is not your partner. Like, she's your, she's your beloved. And, and I, love, I love that um, difference that you're trying to kind of, kind of create there. And I think that word partner, it's even infiltrated the marriage space. You, you hear it kind of a lot in the, in the world now in society. It's like, they're not even husband and wife anymore. It's like, no. this is my partner. I mean, so that in of itself is like creating that, that, that relationship where, yeah, we're kind of, yeah, we're always in this together, but it's, 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 it's preventing that, I guess what would be a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. The way it's called the natural order. So the way it's, it's called the natural order in the Catholic church, in the Christian faith, it's called the natural order. So the actual order is God first, husband, wife, and then children. Now, 
most people think, well, that's 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 chauvinistic. No, it's not. It's called a it's a protection mechanism. It's a protection mechanism against what? Against evil. And and against and physical protection too. Women are not meant. Women and children need protection. Women aren't supposed to be living in an apartment by themselves. They're not supposed to be driving halfway across the country from New York to California by themselves. They're they're not supposed to be women are should have a roommate, at least a roommate, a woman roommate or whatever. If they're married, their husband's supposed to be with them. They shouldn't be riding in car. Why? Because they shouldn't be on the front line in the army. You know why? Because they are the givers of life. As a man, it's our, our job is to protect them. That's why it used to be maybe your father or our father's father, or whatever, women weren't allowed to be by themselves. Why? Because they're too precious. Women have lowered themselves to the level of dirt. Because we can do everything. We don't need you. We can go out and do whatever we want. We don't need... And then as soon as a rapist knock on the back of their head, oh, somebody please save me. Somebody save me. So, no, but you told me, because men, that's how we are, right? You said you don't need us. So, okay, you got it. And that's how God's the same way. If you say, if, if, you, don't, if, you, don't, if you don't sacrifice your time in prayer and suffering and sacrifice, you're basically tell God as a man, hmm, I got it. So what does he do? He leads you to yourself. So that's how kind of men are. We will leave women to themselves if they say they don't need us. That's why a lot of men kind of sit around and go do their pleasure things. Well, she says she don't need me. Because men, we don't, you know how it is, man. I don't know if you go to church or not, but when you go to church, the church full of women. You know why men ain't there? Well, because Jesus got this long hair. Everybody's kind of like, you know, the, there's no masculine things going on up in there. And no matter if you're an atheist or you're a Christian soldier, that turns us off. Like when I go to church, I want, that's why God made church to be led by men. Because if you don't, men won't do nothing, right? And so that's kind of how it works, man. Women, they, and so what happens when a woman steps outside of that protection of the natural order, the natural order, then what happens is, let's say she wants to divorce her husband and she steps outside of that protection. Then what happens is she gets attacked by the diabolical, by the, by, by the by Satan. When you come back in, and that's why when men don't follow Christ, then that's what happens to us. Chaos begins in our life. Now, it doesn't happen at first, but over your life, if you don't come in order, it does. That's incredible, brother. And I definitely want to, if we can, I want to get more into some of those issues with the feminization of the church, because I think that's kind of what you're getting to there at the end. I want to circle back, though, to one of the initial things that you said when you were talking about that story of Adam in the garden. I've used this a lot with the men that I coach and work with, uh, because a lot of these men think that the, the problem that they're dealing with pornography is rooted in a lack of a intimate relationship with a woman, when in reality, they're lacking mission, purpose, kind of passion, a lot of other external variables. So they always think like, if I find a woman, it's going to take care of these issues. And it's like, no, because you're going to enter into that relationship as the same man that is struggling with some of these self leadership principles. Because ultimately, when I hear the saying that you're responsible for everything, but don't need to do everything, that's kind of what you said God assigned Adam to do. And that's a calling for men. I see that as like, we need some leadership. Like that's, that's the call to be a leader, protecting, defending, serving, all leadership traits, all leadership skills, all leadership abilities. So if a lot of this sounds like it's rooted in lack of self-leadership first with men, and then the ability to lead others. We have a mastermind program that is, that is partnered. I partnered with a Navy SEAL to literally take men through a 12-month curriculum that we provide them 11 virtues and tenets to really master their individual self-leadership. But in your opinion, where can a men begin to go to develop these leadership skills? First of all, like I said, it's, it goes to the mission. Once you understand that, then you understand. And then, but see, the thing about this man is these, it all starts with God and prayer. The problem is, man, men, we have this thing where I can do it all on my own. Like I, some of the guys in your office right now are probably saying, well, see, man, that's a crutch. Man, God is not a crutch, homie. God is giving my mission of what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to be. And how am I supposed to act? If you think about it, think of all the Christian men you know. They're good citizens in the country. They're good citizens. You know, they, they take care of business for, mo most, for the most part, you know. And so when you're, when you, the more you pray and you get in union with God and Christ, what happens is 
you become, you get what's called a fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is called wisdom. And what happens is you start to see the world for what it really is. And so when you get to see that, and, and when you see the world for what it really is, it, it's painful. But what you do is you persevere. And that, when the love of Christ helps you love your wife better, it helps you love your children better. It helps you want to be a better man because Christ is the example. Now, listen, in the Catholic faith, and I know a lot of Christian faith, they don't have him on the on a crucifix, but Christ on the crucifix, why? To show us men how to be men. That self suffering and sacrificing and giving our life away for something more than ourselves is the core of a man. You will never be happy and satisfied and fulfilled as a man as long as long as if you're not willing to die for something. And who you're willing to die for makes a difference too. God, your wife, your children, and then your country. That's how it works, man. And and people, that's what he said when we talk about effeminacy, about um, about uh, 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 about um, pleasure all the time. We forget how to be warriors. That's why you pray because prayer is hard. It's hard. Religion is hard. That's why guys don't want to do it. They give you every excuse why I can't get on my knees and get in the church and go to church and do what I'm supposed to do. Prayer and religion makes you a warrior. Makes you want to sacrifice your life for something. But most guys today, well, I'm going to sacrifice, but I'm going to go try to make a billion dollars. Well, can you take that billion dollars with you when you die? Can you? No, you can't. Is your life, you know, there's a reason, there's a reason, there's a reason, Frank, that somebody's born in the United States and somebody's born in Haiti. Haiti is probably one of the poorest countries on the planet. The United States is one of the richest. Why, why, why is that like that? It's not a coincidence, man. Souls are placed in the world where they are most able to come to God. Whatever that soul needs is what God places us. And so, like with our wife, when our wife, if you have pain in your life right now, I don't care if it's financial, I don't care if it's wife, kids, or whatever, it's because your britches are getting too big, and God's saying, you're moving too far away from me, and I love you enough because I want you to come to me at the end of your life to come to heaven, and what's the problem is you're not seeing that. You're not listening to the Holy Spirit talk to you. So when I say, oh, I know I said a lot, but you have to understand the creator is in everything in our lives, even when we breathe. But people don't really understand that. They really don't. Yeah, that's great, uh, Jerry. I'd love, to, I'd love to go back a little bit here. Um, as we've been talking about lack of mission is, is a big underlying issue for a lot of men. I'd love to talk about your mission. Obviously, we've, we've mentioned that you're the creator and founder of Catholic Alpha. Walk us through the genesis of this journey for you, if, if you can, and when you got really clear that your mission was to help connect men with their mission. Well, what happened is um, back in 2001, I think. Well, anyway, I'm bad with dates, man. <laughs> but the thing is, back then, yeah, a long time ago, my my first wife, we were in divorce court, and we were um, we were getting divorced, and then she contracted leukemia, and so she had the kind of string of leukemia that you can't cure, and so. We're in divorce court when my wife contracted leukemia. So it almost doesn't get worse than that for a marriage, right? So basically, I had two kids, two boys with my first wife, and she died. And that was the first big pain. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Then the other thing that made me, that got to me is when I started getting into the faith more, I started seeing things for the world for how it really is. And I started thinking, oh, my God, if something happens to me, where are my boys going to go to learn how to be a man? So those two things got me to start thinking, OK, no more am I going to sit around and not do nothing. You can bitch and whine all you want, but that don't call that don't that don't solve nothing. If you're going to if you're going to bitch and whine, get a plan together and go fix it. I don't care if you bitch and whine, but get a go get a plan and go do something, you know. God is about results, you know. And so when I created CatholicAlpha.com, those are the two things. It's like I got tired of men. I knew that if I fixed, if I helped fix men, we would fix the country. Women, you can fix women all you want, but women are designed to follow a great man. 
a virtuous man, a holy man. Think about it. Women don't follow a fool for long. They don't follow a dud for long. They might, if they're married to you, they might suck it up and stay with you for 30 or 40 years. But I got men in my program, they've been married 40, 45 years, and their wife left them. So my point of what it is, man, we that's why I created CatholicGalvin.com, because I, I wanted to start trying to talk to men before they're in marriage crisis, before their wife says, I want to leave, before um, they get a divorce, before they get an annulment. You know, let's, let's try to fix, but see, men, they, you, well, you know the deal. They only come to you when the pain is so bad, there's nothing else. And so I start to realize that, like, I wasn't getting for the first five years, six years, five years, nut crickets. I was just talking to air. Then I started focusing on, okay, man, your wife left you. Your fiance left you. Divorce. You got, uh, you ain't getting sex. You know, all of a sudden, oh, now I get all kind of play now. Because I, this pain, it's pain, it's pain. We all, men only do things when this pain is rough enough. And so that's why I started that for me. And then I got married to my second wife, and we had two boys together. So we got five kids all together, six. And, man, the deal of it is, man, is when you create a great marriage and a great family, there's nothing like it in the world. Guys don't want to suffer for that. They think, well, when she fix her, I'll fix me. See, as I explained to you, your mission, that's not your mission. You fix you because everybody in the house is following, is looking to you. You are the one how, how it's set up. You see what I mean? Absolutely, man. And God, that resonates so, so much with me. The, the need for men to be driven by pain. I, I started a fitness company back in 2000 and late 2016. And it still exists today. Very, very small, uh, very small operation. Do a lot of affiliate marketing there. But Jared, the things that I'm talking about today are exactly the same things I talked about back in 2017, 2018. Like a lot of this self-development life principles, these universal principles to success that I, I believe can be utilized in any single area of your life. Now, it never resonated with anybody back when I was trying to help people build muscle, right? It was like, I wasn't trying to help the overweight guys. I was trying to help the guy that had some muscle want to get to the next level. It's like, so it came from this place where it's like, you're doing well, here's how to do a little bit better with your life. And you're right. It's like nobody, nobody like wanted to hear what I had to say. Then when I started talking to the guy that is in the pain, right? Like you've reached the bottom of your life because that was me. I had to late 2018, lose a business, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, had relationship literally break apart, like health going down the tube. Like I looked in the mirror and it was like, I just saw everything that I'd spent a decade building crumbling right in front of me. And that was a wake up call for me to realize like I was the creator of all these problems, get this porn out of your life, begin to connect deeper with God, find your faith. And then the rest has kind of been history. We've had tremendous success over the last five years. But speaking to that pain, man, that, that, that was so crucial. Why is that the case? And, and, and is there a way that we can get men before they reach that pain? So you've, you've got to understand how God and Christ, how, how, the, how it works. Okay, so the, the universe works like this. So you will always have challenges in your life. You always will. Why? Because that's God's way of showing him, listen, your britches ain't as big as you think you are. You do need me. The reason we are here the, even the reason we are created is because God wanted to share his love and mercy and gift of, of, of happiness with us. Because he's, he's the Trinity. He's all encompassed. He's, he's happy. He doesn't need us to be fulfilled, right? So he created us to do what? To send as many souls back to him to be in eternity in heaven with him. But see, most people want to, they, people are fulfilled. People are happy with saying we come from monkeys. Think about it. People are actually satisfied to know, to think that we came from a gorilla instead of this beautiful story of, of creation, of the, the true story of creation. And when you think about it, it makes sense. So God wants us to come to him as many souls as he can, as we can come. That's why we participate in creation. So that we can send as many souls back to God as we can so that we all can be in front of him in the beatific vision. So we can go to the big party. That's the big party. The big party is at the end of your life, when you're judged, you either go to the big party or you go to the party that, that, that you really don't want to go to, but you think you do. Remember, we send ourselves to hell. God don't send us to hell by our choices. And so that's kind of where it is. And that's where it all starts, man. You had mentioned uh, one of the reasons why you created the, the Catholic Alpha, some of the lessons you learned from the previous marriage, the need to have a place that your men could learn to be a man if for whatever reason 
your exit from, from this earth. But she also said it was because as you were going and getting deeper into your faith, you began to see the world for truly what it is. I think that was kind of the language that you used there. What were some of the things that you began to see differently? There are levels of faith. So there are not, just, just to be, there are like nine levels of prayer. And the first level of prayer is, um, is uh, vocal prayer. So people go, oh, Jesus, 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 I love you so much. Oh, do this for me. Thank you, Jesus. That's, that's the least effective mode of, of prayer. It is. The second and gateway, the second level of prayer and gateway is meditation. Now, I'm not talking about meditation in the yoga. Because yoga, you have to understand the reason the church wants us to stay away from yoga is because those are demon poses. That is a demonic. That's like breaking the first commandment of putting other gods above me. But see, people don't know that. And so the second level is meditation, which is the gateway to the rest of the place. And that's meditation in what? On God. So scripture, the saints, the blessed mother. And so even on hell, because that's all part of the supernatural world. And so that is the gateway to the rest. And the more you meditate on God, the closer you grow to God, the more your mind opens up and the more you see. God only gives you what you ask for. If we go through our lives and we don't ask him for nothing, he's not going to give us nothing, right? And that includes going closer to him. And so I started, once I started getting closer to God, I started to see that a lot of things that are in our country about masculinity and things like that aren't what are, are false. You know, when you look out in the world, just look outside your door. Things are the way they are because men have allowed it. And so when we allow it and we don't stand up and do anything about it, then that's when things get worse. And they will continue to get worse until we become holy, which is what? Holiness is only virtue. There are 64 virtues. Like what you said in your program, you told them about what? 10 virtues? You started teaching the man about 10? Yeah, said, we have 11, 11 yes. supreme virtues, yeah. Yeah, so virtue, those virtues, each virtue you acquire as a man, you become more and more holy, you grow closer to God because that's what Christ wants us to do and that's what he displeased. And so the closer you go to God, like I said, the more he opens your eyes, the more you see, you start to Consider your death, your mortification. Every man every day should consider their mortification, their death. Why? Because it keeps you on your game. It keeps you on your game. But what do they do? You can do whatever you want. You don't have to come to God. Matter of fact, you can go have sex with everybody you want. You can do pornography. Nothing's wrong with that. You can masturbate. Nothing's wrong with that. That's good for you. Whatever makes you happy. All that stuff does is distract you as a man keeps you away from your mission and your purpose of what? Having a relationship with God, creating a great marriage and a great family, children that last generations, and then those children's children, then those children's children's children. And the, that's how you create a legendary marriage. That's how you leave a legacy in this world. Sure, I want to be a billionaire too. I do. But if, 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 if the criteria for being a great man was only about be, making money, then what, do we, what is everybody else here for? What is everybody else here for, brother? If money is the culmination, if career, it, it can't be it. We're supposed to be St. Joseph, the, the mother, father of Jesus Christ and the, and the husband of the blessed mother. He was a great man. You know why? He saved God from the king. You see what I'm saying? Like you said, your, your, your buddy that's a, uh, that was a, a seal in the military and you, you saved, you're doing, you're saving, you got a mission. And when you as a man have a mission and, and what happens is you become fulfilled and you become satisfied. And when you don't, you're in hell on earth because, like you said, a drug addiction, it doesn't even have to be pornography or drug addiction, man. It could just be getting up day to day, going to work at a job you don't like, coming home, eating, kick the dog, kiss the wife, maybe have a little sex, go to bed, but go do it again. Is that really the life you want? We have to, as men, we've got to go out and start doing something. Start freaking doing something, man. Do, as my wife, one of, the, one of the first people ever taught me about self-esteem. I, I never forget. She's brilliant in this. She said she gets tired of people telling kids to have high self-esteem. and have self She said self-esteem is about accomplishing something great. That's when you get self-esteem, when you do something. And that's what me and you are trying to, we're not trying to dog men out. We're not trying to say you're, we blame you for everything. We know women have their problems too. 
But brother, what we got to do is when you st start a ministry, get get come come contact me or contact my man and, and say we want to help you or something. Stop just going through life, going on the golf course every day. That is not a that's not what a real that's what you're here for. This life is a test. It's a every decision you make, everything you talk about, everything you do is a test. A test of what? To see if you are worthy to spend eternity in heaven. Are you worthy to go to the party? Are you worthy for, of that wife that you have, of those children, of your beloved? Are you? That's what it that's what it comes down to, man. And and when that's how my eyes, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how my eyes started getting open. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, man, because you you didn't you hit a chord. But you know, I you know, your eyes get when you're that's how your eyes get open. You start to see the world for what it is, and you start to say, Man, I don't want to participate in that crap no more. Cause it ain't doing nothing for me. What do you Let think? Let it roll, brother. Let the emotions go, man. I'm loving <laughs> loving the energy. You you would not be the first, you'd not be the first grown man to shed a tear on this conversation or on this on this podcast, man. I love it, dude. I wanna I wanna get the other seven because I think you said there were nine levels of of, of prayer, but I want to ask you if you've if you've heard a saying before. So there's a saying, and I and I don't know the original source of it, but it's 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 good men. I'm sorry, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times, hard times create strong men mm -hmm. are, are you familiar have you heard no have you heard i have it but i before? like it how do you process that and where do you see the world being right now under the pre pretext of that statement so good men i'm sorry strong men create good times good times create weak men weak men create hard times hard times create good men where do you see we're at well, right now well that well it goes, it goes back to what we said about earlier, man, about we only do anything, like you said, the last one you said is, is we create, you know, the, if a man doesn't do anything, then what happens is he becomes weak. And so it goes back to understanding what you're supposed to do, understanding that your role and, and how you're supposed to come together. Um, strong pain always creates, it makes you stronger. That's why when you go in divorce, that's why people get the divorce and then they try to go on to another partner. Dude, you're gonna have the same result. Why? Because you taking you with you. You haven't changed. People think, well, I'll get a divorce because I because because the pain is so hard. They get a divorce and then they think, well, this other person's gonna be better. Well, of course, the other person's better at first. At first, go ahead. No, I was gonna say as you're sharing this, I was looking up statistics earlier today in preparation for this. I think the numbers are forty two percent of forty two to forty five percent of first marriages. And in divorce, once you get to second marriage, it jumps up to over 60%. Once you're in your third marriage, the likelihood and probability of you getting a divorce is over <laughs> 70%. And it's speaking to exactly what you're saying right here. You're the problem. You And you're taking you with you into the next relationship without solving what caused the breakup in the first place. It wasn't the partner. Oftentimes, it's the lack of leadership, as we've been speaking about literally since the beginning, in the men. And look, dude, that's why my program is so successful. Is because, yeah, you come there to get your wife back, but then you learn my wife left me for a reason and she ain't coming back if I'm the same dude. And what do dudes do? I promise I'll change. That's what she, he, they'll tell her. I promise I'll change. I'll change. I'll change. And women, they not stupid. Once they get, they, once they get hip to your game, they're going to make you prove that you've changed, which means what? Six months to a year, maybe two. See, because they didn't put up with your stuff for, like I said, 40 years, two years, 20 years. And their thing is, well, you don't love, once a woman starts to think you don't care about a man and you don't love them. Now, of course, the dudes that come to me, they love their wives. Everybody out there right now say, I love my wife. Are you willing to die for her every day? Every day? What, what does die? When, when God says die to yourself, what does that mean? Brother, that means mortification that means you your wants your desires your needs your happiness is below everybody else's you die by giving your time see guys think well if if somebody breaks in my house and they grab my wife and they put a machete to her head and gun to my head and say and they say who are you gonna want we want to die you want you gonna kill your wife or kill you you hope that you would be man enough holy enough to say well of course man kill me kill me but how is that going to happen? 
So how do you show your wife that you love her every day? You get on your knees and you get your butt to mass, which is church. You get on your knees and you give your life away through your time, your time and suffering and prayer and sacrifice for her. And then you will get the grace from God to keep control, keep your home at peace. The problem is men think that we doing it all. You ain't doing it all. It takes the the reason that if you have peace in your home or not say peace, but if you have everything that's kind of cooperative in your home right now, it's because marriage is a sacrament. It's sacred. So when you get married before God, you already get this influx of grace in your in your marriage. Your job, though, is to keep it and make it more as a man. And how do you do that? By giving your time away and suffering for your wife and your children. That's how it works, man. That's how it works, baby. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the question now that probably most people aren't going to expect to come out of a conversation around masculinity, helping men find their purpose, level up this kind of strong kind of passion that we've been speaking with here. You made the statement there that most men love their wives. And I would agree with that hundred percent. I think that they, I think that they do. And I think that they love their children. I think that they love the people that they're connected with in, in, in whatever their circles of influence are. But I'm curious your thoughts because I don't think most men love themselves enough. And oftentimes I think it's that lack of love for self that we don't do the difficult work, right? It's like, I'm not worthy. I'm maybe not valuable. Even getting back to kind of some of that self-confidence and self-esteem that you were speaking about. I think it was Brad Lee a couple episodes ago talked about if you want self-esteem, do something that's esteemable. Yeah. Like, do something that's <laughs> worthy of having the confidence. But I think a lot of time that's rooted because men have been defeated. They've been told that maybe they aren't needed. Maybe they aren't worthy. Maybe they don't, maybe they don't bring value to it, right? It's kind of this whole boss babe thing. Like, I don't need men anymore. So it's like, you got society. You got all these kind of different angles that attack coming under men. So I don't want to point men as the victim here, but I love your thoughts around like, do you think a lot of this is rooted in like, just men just don't love themselves enough? You're not going to like my answer, but the deal is, man, we've got to realize that we're not here to be happy as a man. Sure, there are moments in your life where you are happy, where you go on vacation with your wife and, you know, you get an award at your job or you help somebody. But your main job is to be like that God on the cross. You have to understand that. If we're going around thinking about we, we deserve to be happy all the time, then guess what that means? Well, if I deserve to be happy, then that means God, my wife and kids, they just kind of down there. They just kind of down there. You get confidence through giving your life away. That's where you get your confidence from. That's where you get, that's where you get your worth as a man. I tell the men in my program, from this day forward, your happiness means nothing. It means nothing. You know why? Because that's selfishness. That's thinking about me. No, we can't. We got to get our minds off of us. That's what society teaches us, brother. To talk, you deserve to be happy. You deserve to do whatever you want, whatever makes you see when we, we and I'm well, you can, let me finish though. Let me, let me finish real quick. And so when, when a man starts to get his mind off of his wants, desires, and needs, then what he does is he gets his energies into God, his wife, and marriage, and his children. Then he becomes happy, confident, self-aware, and all of that. And you know why? Because my question to you is, how can, not just to you, but anybody, is how can I as a husband, as a man, be happy when my wife and children are miserable? And God, I'm not, and not, and I'm not in, in grace with God. I can't. That's why we have to learn that we have to take our minds off ourselves and give it away to something else of greater than what we are. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And and I want to maybe help reframe the question a little bit because I wasn't saying that you love yourself, you need to be happy. I, I did an entire 65 minute podcast episode on why happiness is not a worthy pursuit. Like I believe wholeheartedly nice. that that it's not something that we hey, aim email at. Like, that to it me. will be, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. I mean, happiness will be a byproduct of living a life of of, of purpose, meaning, significance, uh, and fulfillment. Chase those things, and you'll have moments of happiness. So mm -hmm. I don't think that when you love somebody, you want them to live a happy life, right? I I'm I'm not a father. I do a lot of work with young men, though young boys. I've coached multiple little league teams. I I I operate and and, and take on the role of a mentor to my nephew. I don't want my nephew to live a happy life. I love him, right? And I love the boys that I worked with, but I would push them and sometimes push them to get uncomfortable because I see potential inside of them. 
So when I say love yourself, that men are lacking love, I think that they're not pushing themselves to, to their full God-given potential. And that God-given potential doesn't always equate to happiness. So reframing that or adding some additional context to that, just what's your thoughts? Like, I don't think I'm right or wrong. No, I just no, would be curious think, on no. you think that men are struggling with self-love. It goes back to this is kind of what I said that, that you will only, it, it's open. Oh. We all love ourselves. I mean, that's an instinct. That's in the natural law of things. I mean, no matter what we do with ourselves, we still, like, if somebody came up to you right now and put a gun in your head, you're not going to go, well, I don't have self-love, so I'm just going to see let you shoot me. Of course not. You're going to you're gonna fend yourself. You're going to get out of that. So, of course, I we could, love I could, I could show you my inbox if I could pull it up, and I get, I get multiple messages weekly from men that are telling me they're going to take their life. Like, oh, yeah. So I, I've I had that, too. That men, I wouldn't say that those men love themselves. And, no, what I'm saying and, is, well, no, no, I, what I'm saying is, you're, you're right, is that I get those, I get those too. I get that too. You know, when somebody tells you in your face right now, like, man, I'm thinking about killing myself. That's when you know that the, 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 the job that you, that the job you're in is very serious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So no, I think that me and you are missing. I mean, you on the same page. I think since we're just saying it different. We're wrapped all. up in Yeah. I think we're probably wrapped up in, in maybe some of the language here and that's, and that's fine. I think, I think we are. <laughs> we agree with each other. If yeah. Line, yeah. We agree with each other. It's, it's maybe just, it's, it's, it's maybe just language here. So yeah, yeah. let's go back to the nine levels of prayer because I think we only got two. I think we got vocal prayer and then meditation. I love you. Walk us through you know, maybe kind of a rapid fire. You won't need a full kind of breakdown, but I'd love to put a loop on that part if we can. Well, I can give you them. And um, look, I am not a, a, a Catholic theologian, but I will give you the names of them. But in, in the gist of it is that the closer you go to God, then the more you, your state in, in, in your, in, and also your state of life, then the more you grow closer to God, the more levels of these prayers that you rise, that you rise. The, the the third, the, the second level of prayer is meditation, which means what? You're in your mind, you are contemplating on God, the universe, Adam and Eve, Jesus Christ. And, and so what that does is that helps you move closer. Then the other levels of prayer, so the third level is effective prayer. The fourth level is prayer of simplicity. The fifth prayer, pray, uh, fifth prayer is infused contemplation. The sixth level is prayer of quiet. The seventh prayer is prayer of union, and the eighth prayer is prayer of conforming union, and then nine is prayer of transforming union. Those are where the saints get to, like St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Alphonse Liguori. Those the saints get to that. And so um, that's where we are, man. Yeah, no, that brother, just I appreciate that. It's just my brain with that open loop wouldn't wouldn't allow us to end this if we never circle back. And completed that. So all I needed was that rapid fire rundown. I didn't have enough time to jot them down in the notes, but at least we have them documented because I know there's going to be men in the audience as well that are going to think and operate exactly the same way. So I'm glad we were able to kind of loop that. I wasn't looking for kind of the the the, the high level. Kind yeah, because I would have been like, okay, you know, on, I'm on good, but I ain't that good. Yeah, I want to talk about the wife's exit strategy though here real quick. I know we're okay. you know we're coming up with maybe 15 minutes or so here, but uh, you know I think one of the things that you help men with is understanding why and when their women are going to leave them and helping them notice some of those signs before it's too late. So if a guy's out there hearing this, you know, maybe his, maybe he's beginning to build or kind of identify some of that tension within the relationship. Right. Or maybe he's like, maybe he's even believing like things are great. Right. You know, we got kids, family, like mortgage bills are all kind of paid, but he's kind of like passively skating by in life. What are some of those early signs that a man can look for in, in his wife to see, hey, is she working on the extra strategy? Because I know it's it's like a two year process, oftentimes. Boy, you are the bomb. thinking about divorce before they actually begin to take the steps. So, you what are some are of those bomb. signs that make it look for? Them? You are the bomb. You are. You said it. You said it. They, women once they get real sophisticated real quick when they when they feel that they're not loved anymore. It's, but see, my job. What happens is they get far out ahead of the man. So when she tells you. I want a divorce or I'm leaving. You're like thinking, well, dang, I just got home from di from uh, work. Can we have some dinner? <laughs> you know, she's so far ahead of you. So one of my jobs is to help is to stop the damage and then to catch you up. Because once a man catches up, it becomes a, a, a good battle now. Right. But see, at first, you're just like, like somebody took a hammer and hit you in the head. So the wife's exit strategy is the, really the main reason I wanted to create Catholic Alpha is because I want to give men 
a heads up of how to get things together before they come into that. Okay. So the first, the first, the first clue that you got marriage problems is your wife snagging you. Most guys at that time, they don't listen, right? Why? Your wife's nagging you because she's sensing that the emotional connection is leaving. Remember I said earlier, the emotional connection is everything to a woman. It's everything. It's above God. If they don't have it, they, they look like, well, I can't make myself love him no more. So what am I here for? If a woman, a woman, if a woman starts to think she can be happier without you than she can with you, she will leave or ask you to leave. So the second thing, the second level we move to is your wife will move to a separate bedroom, ask you to leave, or get another man. Now, you would think getting another man is like far down the thing, but it's not. You got to remember, men, women are trying to get, trying to play their cards. They can't kick your butt, no matter what all these movies say. They can't kick your butt. So, where they, they have to be like a woman. And so they have to plan and scheme and manipulate and do the things it takes. And so what do they do? She is making her plan. She's got to play her cards to get you to what? To get you to listen. Because for 10 years you didn't and you ain't. And I'm trying to nag you and you ain't listening. Now I'm getting another man and you ain't listening. Now I'm moving out. You ain't listening. Okay, so now I'm, the, the next phase is she's going she's gonna, to um, ask for a separation or ask for a divorce. If things don't change, when I say things don't change, I mean that the emotional connection is, stop, is starting up, it's not coming back, and you're still the same guy you were five years ago or 10 or 20 years ago. The next phase is uh, I will file for divorce, and then the next phase is I will get a divorce because in every state now, that's what you call the evil no-fault divorce, which means I can say, you know, she, she touched my arm wrong. I want a divorce, right? And then in the eyes of the state, your marriage is over. We have to divorce, right? You hear, listen to what I said. In the eyes of the state, your marriage is over. But in the eyes of who, it's not over. In the eyes of God, your marriage is not over. And so that's what the Reformation did in, back in 500 years ago when it, when it, when it created all these Christian sects. The, the religion, the Catholic and the, the Christian religion got diluted. So people don't even realize that. So now, after they get a divorce, if they're Catholic, they know, see, people get very smart when they want something. So the next thing is, in the, I gotta get, in order to get God to approve my divorce, I gotta get an annulment. So an annulment in the Catholic faith means that your marriage never was. That's what it means. It's not a Catholic divorce like everybody thinks. It means your marriage never was. It was unlawful. What does that mean? That means before you were married, Let's say your wife was a lesbian and you guys got married and she didn't tell you. So then you come home one day and your wife's in the bed with another, with another woman. First of all, of course, most of us be like jumping in with her. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but no, but basically um, she, you see, she's like, what are you doing? What? Well, you in the bed with a woman. Well, what are you in the bed with a woman for? Well, I'm, I'm a lesbian. You are. You didn't tell me. So basically that means that you, that marriage was unlawful because the wife lied or did lie, not telling is still lying. Didn't tell him that she was a lesbian, which means she likes women. And so he, and the thing about it is they still could have got married if he said, okay, I don't mind that you're a lesbian. It's fine. And then they got married. Then the marriage is, was be, would not be unlawful, but it's anything enormous. Or if you don't tell the truth or if you, 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 you know, you kind of twist the lie and you're not, you know, and so that's where that is. So now when the wife's exit strategy, when you have a divorce in the eyes of the state, your marriage is over. And now if you get an annulment in the eyes of God, your marriage is over. And she will get it because the Catholic Church today, they give annulments out like they give out divorces, candy. So that's your future, man. And so my job is when you come to me, whatever that state, whatever stage you're in, nobody comes to me when their wife nags them, just so you know. They never, they never come to me at that point. Um, but is I try to stop stop the damage and keep your wife in where she's at right now. Because if you let her go to the next phase, it's harder to get her to come back or whatever. You, one of the things you said when you asked that question is, man, you know, like he, you feel like something ain't quite right or you feel a little stressed out and, and you feel like your wife, you know, your wife just ain't herself or we're kind of not really like we should be or were. Okay, that's your clue that something's wrong. If you and your wife ain't close like you was, and, and we don't mean to do it, man. Frank, we don't mean to do it. What happens is life. 
marriage is the hardest relationship in the or on the planet to get great to make great because it, it takes constant work but the payoff is tenfold guys think she fix herself i'll fix me but that's not how it works what you do is you serve first and then your wife will serve you tenfold that's because that's in them yeah, no, I appreciate that, man. And I and I asked a question because I know men wait to the point of no return and then it's too late. And if I can do anything here today, it's 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 looking for some of those signs early on so that we can reach out, so that we can get the help, we can get in the community, we can get in the brotherhood, we can get the coaching, we can get the mentorship, we can get the tools, the tactics, the strategies, whatever it is that we're lacking. There's a resource out there readily available. For us, and I want and to we all have coaches. That early, and that's another thing. Another thing about on. men too is we all have coaches. Like you got a coach, I'm sure, or you've had a coach. A I've got a coach. I've had. You know why? Because those people, whatever part of the life of you in, they can help you excel at that part to make the rest of your life better. And that's kind of what I do. What you do is like you want to help them in their marriages because that's the most important relationship in their life. If you can get that right, everything else is kind of you know it's not as bad. You know. Jerry, where can, uh, where can the men connect with you? Where can they learn more about uh, you, your work, your coaching, the Catholic Alpha? And on top of that, do you only work with practicing Catholics? Or if you're coming from any part of the Christian faith, can you be a part of your work? And do you take on people that are non-believers as well? Okay, so I'll answer the last one first. I really, so you have to understand, in order to, to get the benefit, and under you, you have to be a believer. In Christ, for me, I mean, for me, the reason why is because the regimen I'm gonna take you through is to grow you closer to get a better relationship with God, which is which is prime purpose. Then we go over masculinity, and then we go over intimacy. So, but your your the, your foundation is is Christ. I mean, if you don't have that, and I'm fighting you, we go we we work together. I'm fighting you every week on that. We never gonna yeah. get nothing done. <laughs> It was kind of maybe a silly question, but I mean, it's right there in the name, right? You know, right. Catholic Alpha. Like, it's so, not gonna you're not gonna attract somebody that's like exactly. I'm not, not even at least that. pursuing. You know, like I attracted you because you know I'm a Christian, right? You know, yeah. I'm a, you know I was a Christian. So to ask your question about other, of course, I'm Catholic, so I'm quickly call myself Catholic Alpha. But I help Protestants, with, you know, Baptists and Methodists, whatever you are, non denominational. I have all of those guys in my program too, because our common goal is what Christ. We want to please Christ. That's our common goal. So of course, yeah, yeah. So savemycatholicmarriage.com, savemycatholicmarriage.com. And then that is, if like we've helped you today. Me and Frank have helped you today. Okay, so if you think you want to go, you want a little bit more help, then you go to savemycatholicmarriage.com and there's a marriage masterclass there. And then you watch that and that's free, right? And then if you want more help after that, there's a button that pops up and you want more help after that, then you can talk to me. And then I help you again for free for an hour. And then you decide if you want to work long term, if, if your problems are so big that you need more help after that. And so, like you say, I don't, I don't try to force a man to save his marriage, dude. I don't talk. I used to, guys would come to me. I'd be like, man, because I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted, sometimes I think I care more about their marriages than they do. <laughs> and I was like, man, I would try to say, man, look, just let's just do this, man. I can help you, man. Let's, you know, and and they, you know, they don't. And so I don't, I, I wouldn't, I moved away from trying to talk somebody into something because it doesn't work anyway. Yeah. You got to be ready to change in order to change, man. You know, I, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty extensive high level sales background where we learned a lot of, you know, high level NLP influence persuasion techniques. It can work to sell some materialistic products. Absolutely. You can definitely pull on some of those levers there and maybe make a customer happy. If you pull on some of these tools, man, with transformational change, transformational coaching, like you and I do, you're going to end up having somebody that is unengaged in your program. They're not going to be a valuable client and it's going to soak up more time and energy from you as the coach than it would <laughs> in return of what you get back from it. So we have the same approach, man. You know, we, we want to help guys that are, that are ultimately looking for change as well. So we'll get all that plugged down there in the show notes, guys, save my Catholic marriage.com. Jay, I really appreciated this. Um, you know, I know we kind of pushed, went back and forth. I think that's what makes for a very engaging conversation. So really, really grateful for you, man. So we have our last question. We end every single episode here with this question. And obviously the title of the show, Jerry is called the superhuman life. For me, when I talk about living a superhuman life, it's, it's, it, it's really, it's a belief system. It's how I try to show up in the world every day, serve the, and, and, and serve the audience, serve the men, serve everybody that I'm doing. And it's coming from the place as a believer. I do believe that we're put on this earth for a purpose, right? We talked a lot about 
the need and, and the pursuit of finding your mission, right? But it's understanding that there's a mission, step one. And that's where a lot of people stop, right? Yeah, God created me for a purpose. God gave me this, this life. I'm so grateful for all of that. If we're not intentional about our development, we're not intentional about our physical development, our emotional development, our physical, our mental development, like that's where you begin to live a superhuman life is when you're very intentional about your own growth and then how you're bringing that purpose and mission to the world in service of others. So that's my definition of living a superhuman life, but I love to always end every conversation with a guest take. So Jerry Jacobs Jr., as we close out today's conversation, how would you define living a superhuman life? The way I look at it is the definition of a man and what I live my life by is my relationship with God, the love, respect, and devotion of my wife, and the respect and love of my kids. To me, that's the only definition. That's the only thing that really matters, those three. Everything else is gravy, if you can get it. But those three first. And every day, because that, that, that gets me up every day. That gets me, because if I don't pray for my wife and kids, who's going to do it? Nobody. That's that's why prayer is important. That's my that's you know to answer your question. That's my life. And once I learn that, then that's how I live my life every day, every day. Incredible, brother. Uh, guys, you heard it here. Superhuman is God, wife, kids in that order. So good after guys. We love you. Can I say one more uh, thing, please? Two things. First of all, guys. To improve your marriage in two weeks, no matter if you have a great marriage, a, a bad marriage, or whatever, or bad, or whatever, when your wife is talking, your mouth is closed. And your body language is showing her that you are interested in what she's saying. And you only talk at the end by saying, well, is there anything I can do to help? Or you give a positive comment on what happened. That right there alone will help you uh, in, your, in your marriage. Um, and that's really all I got. I just want to make sure that guys understand. I really want to give them a, a practical tip before we left to help them really help, them, really help them. <laughs> yeah. That's why God gave you two, oh, the last thing. two ears oh, and one mouth. Keep your mouth shut and ears open. But, and another thing is, if your wife is not shouting from the mountaintops how great of a husband you are, how much she loves you, how much how good a father you are, and she's not shouting and she's not your number one fan, you got to ask yourself why. Why? That's powerful. We'll end it on that one. Guys, if you got value out of this, uh, share it, like, subscribe. The five-star ratings, written reviews are incredibly valuable as we continue to grow this mission and grow this platform. Guys, but pr the most important one is if there's a guy in your life, whether it's your brother at church, whether it's your friend from work, whether it's your colleague, who, wh whatever the case may be, if he's struggling in his marriage, and he needs to hear this, do us a favor and him the blessing by sharing today's conversation with him. But for Jerry Jacobs Jr., your host here, Frank Rich at the Tumor Life, we love you guys. We'll see you next week.